Can we turn off some of the lights? They're saying they can't see the screen in the back. Maybe we can just put the stop on me and then turn everything off. Are you okay with that? We've been on 
taste the dinner knife and uh, countless conversations about the gospel. Um, great men. The idea behind uh, this content, um, we're going to go through three different parts, recognizing a crucial conversation, um, formulating what it is we want to say, why we want to say it, how we want to say it, and then actually speaking. So for about 35 or 40 minutes of what I'm going to say, we haven't even started talking yet, okay? So these are the three, these are the three parts we're going to go over. First of all, recognize. Can everybody see that in the back? Just before I, I don't want to be 20 minutes in and have somebody say you can't see it. It's this color the whole time. Is this good in the back? Okay, great. Okay, so recognize. Um, the reason others get defensive with us is not because we lack the right skills, but because we have the wrong motives. So change what you want, and you will change how you act. That's what we're going to talk about here in the first part. By definition, a crucial conversation is any conversation with high stakes, strong emotions, opposing opinions. Okay, when one or two or all three of those, and regardless of the combination, show up, this is called a crucial conversation. Okay, so these happen all the time. Sometimes they're planned. Uh, sometimes we have a meeting coming up, or we have, you know, a date coming up, or a specific activity, or we know family's coming over, and we're going to talk about something, and sometimes they just pop up while you're standing in line at the grocery store, or in a Sunday school conversation, or whatnot. Um, when we get, when a conversation becomes crucial, most of us have a tendency to uh, react to what we call silence or violence. Okay, so this is a dialogue, this is not physically. Silence in a dialogue is to withdraw, withhold, or avoid conversations. Okay, anybody ever somebody see somebody go like this? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. And they try to walk away, and then you're not done, so they, okay, that's just silence, okay? Um, violence is to withdraw, or excuse me, violence is to control, attack, or to label in our dialogue, okay? Um, silence or violence. So withdraw, withhold, avoid the discussion, control, attack, or label during the discussion, okay? So is, is everyone right now facing a crucial conversation that's either not going well or that you are avoiding? Okay, does this resonate, does this make sense? Okay. So again, high stakes, strong emotions, opposing opinions. The thing that I love about this, um, raise your hand if you find yourself naturally having a tendency to become silent. Where are my silent people, okay? Violence, control, attack, label, okay? Who starts with one, moves to the other? Okay, that's me too, okay? So, uh, so we've been married for 27 years, my wife and I. When we first got married, it took us three days to fight. Um, she didn't want to talk about it right away, and I was ready. Like, conversation came up, let's go. It took her a day to think about it. After a day, I was ticked off. I didn't want to talk about it. And then at the third day, we were both finally in the same place, okay? Now we have it down to about 30 minutes. Um, it's still the same, it's still the same thing, we're just quicker about it because we recognize one of these is not better than the other. Okay? If you're silent or violent, or start with one and go to the other, there's not a better way necessarily, one or the other. They both mean the same thing. They're both a sign that someone does not feel safe. Okay? So if you can recognize it in yourself. I'm going to teach you skills how to fix it. And if you can recognize it in others, I'm going to teach you skills how to fix it. Okay? But when you're talking with your kids or your grandkids and your 15-year-old like mine goes silent, he just doesn't feel safe. And then I continue to press him and he goes violent. He still doesn't feel safe. It's the exact same thing, manifest in two different ways. When, it, when somebody doesn't feel safe, dialogue stops. It either goes silent or it goes does that make sense? So I don't want you to think that you're better or worse than somebody else because you do one and they do the other. They're both a manifestation of lack of safety, okay? So, what are we going to do about this? Um, we're going to start with heart. So what this means is that we want to focus on what we really want, okay? Um, what am I behaving like? Are my behaviors in accordance with what I really want? Uh, what results do I want? What results do I want for myself? What results do I want for others? For the relationship? For the organization? 
for the family, whatever. Okay, well, what do I really want? So everybody understands the psychology of the brain um, <coughs> when the amygdala fires and adrenaline rushes to our body, fight or flight mode, okay, all the blood goes to our arms or legs. This is really, really great if we live with saber-toothed tigers, um, but it's not really great for relationships. Okay? So the same way when you lift weights or when you run or exercise or hike or whatever, the blood goes to your arms and your legs because you're using those things. When we need to use our brain, we need to get blood going there. So the way we do that is we ask ourselves a question. What do I really want? What do I really want for this relationship? What do I want for you? What do I want for me? What do I want for us? What do I want for them? What do I want for whatever it is? Ask a question and get the blood pumping back in the brain again. Okay? So when you recognize the conversation becomes crucial because you see in yourself or others silence or violence, what do I really want? What do I want for this person? What do I want for myself? Okay? Think about that. Re-engage the brain. Get the blood pumping back there. Okay? So this is, this is recognized. We, we recognize that a conversation is crucial because we see the signs of silence or violence. Somebody's not bad if they go silent. Somebody's not bad if they go violent in their dialogue. Okay? It's a sign of lack of safety. One thing about this too is once we establish safety, we could lose it at any moment. So we always want to be on the lookout for signs of lost safety. Okay? Uh, we have sometimes we start a conversation and it's going great, and then all of a sudden, whoa, where did that come from? Okay, safety has been lost, so we want to restore safety. But the first thing we need to do is be able to recognize it in ourselves or others. Okay, everybody with me? Mm -hmm. We haven't even started talking yet. <laughs> so, uh, number two, formulate. So, the limiting factor of all of our communication is not the riskiness of the message you want to share but how safe you can help others feel hearing the message, okay? There's a big bold phrase in this book that says, you can talk to almost anyone about almost anything, okay? So I love the word almost because everybody knows that there are some people that are irrational, just not reasonable. You can't talk to everyone about everything, but almost, okay? Almost everyone about almost everything. Uh, so let's, now that we kind of understand what it looks like when safety is lost, um, when it's not present, let's talk about what it is. Okay? That will help us in our understanding of how to restore safety. President Nelson actually talked in, in his um, conference address that we needed more mutual respect in our dialogue. Okay? And these are the two things required for safety. Mutual purpose and mutual respect. So I'm going to share with you a lot of acronyms. This one is called CRIB, C-R-I-B. So commit to search for a goal that will benefit both of you. Okay. So if I want to have a conversation, or if there is a result that I need, or if there is a relationship that I want, then I need to commit to finding a goal that is mutually beneficial for both of us. Recognize the difference between what you want versus what you're asking for. Okay? I want to go to the movies and I want to have dinner. I really just want to spend time with you. You don't want to go to the movies and you don't want to go to the dinner. Right? You want to do yard work. Whatever. Okay? What I really want is to spend time with you. So do I actually want to go to dinner and movie? Right? I want to just spend time with you. So recognize the difference between what you want versus what you're asking for. Because that's oftentimes... There's lack of recognition there. Um, sometimes we have to invent a different or a higher, more encompassing goal. Okay? Maybe things are going along just fine the way they are, and we're having trouble going to the next level. It's because we need a next level goal. Okay? Maybe the relationship has gone as far as it can with our current goals. We need a next level goal to take us further or higher or beyond or to our ultimate place. Sometimes goals are baby steps. Once we accomplish one, we feel like we've bottomed out, you know, it's been three months and I don't know if this is really going anywhere, well maybe there's another goal that could be set, right? If we remember, mutually beneficial. Sometimes that's the hardest part is you find the benefit, but they don't, right? Um, my daughter lives over here in Provo, she's going to UVU. 
She's been on three dates with this guy, really, really nice guy, and she's just not really interested in the rest. Um, and so he asked her out, and she said no, and he's like, well, maybe next week, and she said no, and he's like, well, I'm going away for summer sales, maybe when I get back? No. <laughs> right? Not mutually beneficial, sometimes that's hard. Um, and it's interesting, too, because once she finally said, I just need to share with you, like, you are great. Like, you really are. You are a great person. But you brought me gifts. You text me throughout the day. She's like, I don't think about you at all. And you're great. And you deserve someone who thinks about you all the time. It's just not me. And then he got mad, which was great for her because she understood that she made the right decision. Right. Was that what I missed? What did I miss? Oh, I thought I heard a comment. Okay. I said it was a crucial conversation. It was a crucial conversation. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yeah. Yes, it was. Okay. You following me on this? Um, brainstorm new uh, and mutually satisfactory strategies. Maybe the goal was aligned, but the strategy to get there is just not aligned. Right. You always want to go spend money, and I don't want to always spend money. Maybe we need a new strategy about spending, not spending, some kind of strategy that will help us with the goal that we are both in agreement with. But the way we go about it might need change, something in the strategy. Okay? So this is mutual purpose. So mutual respect, this one's a little less obvious, but it's like air. You don't notice it until it's gone, and then that's all you notice. Okay? Um, in, our, in our culture, I think we kind of tend to automatically, um, first impression, just kind of give respect to each other, and then we kind of take it away a little bit at a time or all at once. Um, but with regards to respect, watch for emotions. Um, watch when somebody has to defend their dignity. Okay, that's a, that's a loss of respect and it needs to be restored. Um, if somebody gets highly charged, or their fear turns to anger, there's a lack of respect sometimes that exists in these moments, okay? Um, show that you care about them because you care about the good intentions. Um, this, this mutual respect is the continuance condition for dialogue, okay? We don't stay in conversations very long with somebody who we don't respect or who doesn't respect us. So this, this is very important. This is something we always need to be building. Um, it's fine if it's given, but it needs to continually be earned. It's the continuance condition to remain in dialogue. Okay? Uh, communication, this is, this is what we need to have all the time. So here's another little way to look at this in a, in a graph. Uh, if there is a clear problem, if mutual respect is what's missing, we can apologize. If mutual purpose is what's missing, we can crit. So same acronym, okay? I want to spend a couple minutes here talking about apologies, because as men, we do not do well with this, okay? Um, this, this is beneficial to everyone, but I just want you to understand the difference. So remember when you had little kids, or when you were a little kid, and you pushed your brother down, or your sister, and they cried, and your mom said, say sorry, and you said sorry, and then you're good to go, right? Everybody remember that? You've seen that before? How's that working now? It doesn't, it doesn't work as adults, okay? So we need to understand what an apology is, okay? There's a couple different parts. So first of all, recognize that there's been some kind of harm done, okay? Um, so I am sorry for this thing, okay? I told you I was going to call, and I'm sorry that I didn't call, okay? But that's not it. I'm sorry that I didn't call because I know it made you think about and feel all these different ways, and that's what I'm sorry for. I have zero intentions of making you feel like you are not important, that you are second choice, that you are... And you explain all those possibilities of what that person could be feeling because of that particular action. Okay? So, my wife and I are out on a double date uh, with some friends. We're having pizza, the latest pizza. We're sitting there, we're having a great time. All of a sudden, my buddy says something. I literally, I've asked him, 
I've asked him since then what he said, and neither one of us can remember. His wife can't remember, he can't remember. I literally don't remember. But in the moment when he said it, I went, and his wife stood up and walked off. And I just put my head down, and I kind of looked at my wife, and I looked at my friend, and he really didn't notice. He just kept eating his pizza. And she walked back out, and she said, let's go. And she just walked out the door. And this all would have been fine, except I was driving. Um, and so I looked at my wife, and I'm like, boxes, boxes, boxes. And so she ran and got boxes, and I started cleaning up. And my buddy is like, where's my wife? I'm like, dude, she's outside. So we boxed up our pizza, and we got in the car, and started it up, and she got in the back seat with her husband, and she sat as close to the door as anybody could possibly sit. And I wished so bad that my Bluetooth would have connected immediately, because it was just dead silent all the way home. Um, we got to her house, I almost had it in park, and she opened the door and she was out. And I looked back at my friend, and, and he goes, and I said, meet me in the middle. So we lived about four houses away. So I drove home, my wife was like, go get him, help him out. So he walked down two houses, I walked up the street two houses, and we stood in the middle of the street at 11.30 at night talking about what just happened. And he didn't, he didn't see it, and I had to explain this, and I, you said this, and this is how she felt, and I don't know why she felt that way, but this is how she felt. Why did she feel that way? So he went on to describe how just recently the series of events were similar to these other series of events from five years ago, and 17 years ago, and 22 years ago. <laughs> And so um, I made him practice. We sat there in the street and I said, okay, I need you to go home and I need you to say, I'm sorry that I said, and I, neither one of us can remember now what he said, but I'm sorry that I said this because I know it made you feel this way and I know that because you felt that way five years ago and seven years ago and 17 years ago and 21 years ago. And I made him practice, just like a little kid. It was awesome. <laughs> and the next morning I got a text from his wife and all she said was, I don't know what you did, but... Okay, so this is the value of an apology. I'm sorry for the thing I did because it made you feel this way. And that is something I do not want you to feel. Okay, everybody with me? So when mutual respect is lost and it's a clear problem, an apology. When mutual purpose is lost and it's a clear problem, crib. Now if there's a misunderstanding, either one, whether it's mutual, mutual purpose or mutual respect, we use a contrasting statement. I love this. This is one of my favorite skills. This is easy. You can immediately go and apply this, except everybody in the, in the snack room after this will know exactly what you're doing, so you might have to wait just a minute. Uh, but all this is, it's a contrasting statement. It's just like a black and white photo. It's the same kind of concept. I know, and I'm going to come and talk to you about this thing, that there's a possibility that you might feel a certain way. Okay? For example, boss comes to you on Wednesday and says, hey, I need to talk to you Friday at 4.30. What are you thinking? Yeah. Okay. So all week long, right, you drive home Wednesday night, and oh my gosh, like, what is that thing on Friday? Like, I think I'm doing my job good. Like, I don't think there's any laughs that I've heard. Oh my God. Okay. We come to work on Thursday. We're whispering to other people. I'm asking questions. Is anybody else at the meeting on Friday at 4.30? Nobody else does. And then we get to the meeting on Friday at 4.30, and the boss says, hey, thanks so much for staying after. I know it's late. I have something awesome that I want to share with you. It's so good. But I just couldn't tell you because we have a meeting today at 3.30, and the outcome of that meeting was what's going to determine the specifics of our meeting right now. But it includes a raise and a job title and more travel, which is exactly what you want. Okay? So a contrasting statement is, in anticipation of a potential misunderstanding, I'm going to come to you and say, hey, can you stay after work Friday at 4.30? I have a really cool conversation I need to have with you. You're gonna love it. I just can't tell you yet, because there's a meeting at three o'clock that has to happen first, and then I can share with you the details. Now, how do you feel? Yeah, right? You said Friday, it's Wednesday afternoon, right? So a contrasting statement in anticipation of a misunderstanding that could occur, okay? If we know in advance, we can lead with a contrasting statement, okay? I would like to, ask you out. I know that you might feel this way about this, but I want you to know that that's my, not my intention. My intention is this. Okay? Or the reverse happens. Okay? You're on that date. Something comes up, and you recognize it, and it's just a misunderstanding. That happens all the time. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to make you feel this way. I can see that. I don't want this. I do want this. My intention was not that. My intention
intention was this. I can see how I misspoke. I apologize for that. I didn't mean to make you feel or lead you to think that. Okay, a contrasting statement. So years ago, my daughter comes upstairs. She's like seven. She says, Dad, Isaac won't let me play with his Nintendo DS, a little handheld Nintendo DS. He's nine. And I'm like, why wouldn't my son let her play with the DS? Oh, last time she played with it, she left it out. And when he wanted it, it was out of batteries. It took an hour to charge. He was frustrated. So I said, go downstairs and say, Isaac, can I please play with your DS? I won't leave it off the charger when I'm done. I'll put it back in your room on the charger. And I made her practice. And then I heard her go downstairs, and she literally was like, Isaac, can I please play with your DS? I won't leave it off the charger. I'll put it back in your room. <laughs> and he goes, sure. And she goes, Dad, he said yes. <laughs> so anytime you anticipate a misunderstanding or when one occurs, just use a contrasting statement. A don't statement followed by a do statement. Easy enough? Really cool skill. Yeah. Oh, that's a great segue for my last slide. That was perfect. <laughs> I, usually I do the segues, but that was really, really great. So her question was, what about the feeling or the tone behind what we're saying? And we'll get to that. That's in the speak part. I'm still on section two. We're still formulating. That was good. You're ready. You're ready. So one other thing to think about as we're, as we're formulating what we're going to say is this fool's choice. Um, we used to call it the sucker's choice, fool's choice, same idea. Anytime we use it either or. Okay? So sometimes when we're trying to come up with a mutual purpose, we're looking for common goals, or we're looking for systems that we can put in place, oftentimes we think it has to be an either or, right? Um, we have to either cheer for the Broncos or the Raiders, but we cannot cheer for both of them at the same time, okay? So if you can replace either or with and, just replace it with and. First, clarify what you don't want. Clarify what you do want. Present your brain with a more complex problem. Okay, ask yourself a question. Is there a way that we can use and? Can we possibly do this and that? Um, Steph Curry and his brother Seth Curry both play in the NBA. One plays for the Warriors, one plays for the Blazers. Their parents go to all their games, and when they play each other, mom doesn't wear one and dad wears the other jersey. They cut a jersey in half and sew it so they both wear hats. Okay? And. Just and. Okay? Instead of either or. The same thing is true for the word but. Right? I love you, but. Sure does bother me when you do this thing. Okay? So everybody knows but is a big eraser. It doesn't matter what you said before that, how long you said it, your tonality, all those things. It doesn't matter when you say but. It just erases it all. Okay? You can say, I love you for all these things, and can I talk to you about something else? And, okay? So another skill that I love is called CPR. I want to tell you a story about this. Um, so five kids, uh, twins, my second and third daughters, paternal girls. They look like sisters. They definitely don't look like twins. Um, when you have twins, anybody have twins in here? So our experience with twins was really fun. We had tons and tons of girls that would come to our house because one phone call got you two friends, okay? And so we would get one phone call and then a girl would come over because she could play with two friends. But there was one girl that lived in our neighborhood um, who was into dance and my kids were into basketball and dance and basketball both practice in the gym at the school and they can't practice at the same time. So dance goes first, basketball goes second, basketball first, dance second. Basketball is a two-hour practice, dance is a two-hour practice, so every day for about four hours, they are literally in opposite schedules. Um, and then what happens at basketball practice is all those girls, they decide to do something afterwards together, okay? So you can probably see where this is going. This dance girl got left out of a lot of my daughter's activities, not intentionally, but because that's just how these two worlds worked. Um, this girl's mother was a dancer growing up, had very similar experiences, and did not want that to happen to her daughter. So after a couple years of this, she actually called a meeting, uh, me and my daughter, and her and her husband and her daughter. And we were supposed to go to their house to talk about this rift that existed in the neighborhood, and the board, and the relationship, uh, because my daughter was leaving out her daughter from these activities. So I sat my daughter down and we talked about crucial conversations at 14 years old, and I specifically taught her 
this content pattern relationship, okay? So content is this specific issue. So in this story, there were a bunch of specific issues, okay? She didn't get invited to a birthday party one time, okay? My daughters just forgot. They only invited the basketball team, okay? Um, she didn't get invited over to the house after school because she was at dance. My daughter's at basketball in the morning that day. There were a bunch of specific issues. Sometimes those specific issues are just standalone problems, but sometimes they add up to be a pattern of, in this mother's mind, disrespect, purposely leaving them out. Okay, there was this pattern of behavior, ultimately leading to a relationship issue. Okay, following me? So this is a great way to, in a conversation, put a pin in it. Everybody's heard that expression. Okay, we're having this conversation, all of a sudden this offshoot comes up from that. It's important, we want to talk about it, but let's put a pin in it, because what I'm doing right now is talking about specific content issues. And what you just brought up is a pattern of behavior that I can show you from these issues. So I'm going to come to that in a second. I'm going to first talk about these random, specific issues. I'm going to then tie them together, show you the patterns that were created, and ultimately, we're going to talk about the relationship. Okay, everybody with me? So I prep my daughter for CPR. We walk up to the house, we sit down, and I kid you not, this 35-year-old woman and her husband and their 14-year-old daughter and my 14-year-old daughter, this, this woman, she immediately went to control, attack, and label, okay? Um, she took right over the conversation, controlled it. Um, she didn't attack me at all, she attacked my daughter, and then she labeled her by calling her an effing B. Okay? I almost, Jumped over the table to kill her husband, right? <laughs> but my daughter, 14 years old, said, I know why you feel that way. She said, I did not invite your daughter to my birthday party. And I did exclude her from that activity after school. But I want to share with you why. And explain what I just explained to you about the schedule and sometimes these things happen and when we do think about it, remember those three Saturdays in a row we did those things? We didn't have basketball, she didn't have dance. Whenever there's a conflict, she doesn't get invited and whenever there isn't, she does. And the night ended with cookies and milk and an invitation to come over at 6 o'clock in the morning to do hair and makeup and drive to school together. And I didn't say a word. Okay? Content pattern relationship. Okay, that was a pretty good relationship, yeah. Was there an apology at all from the mom? No. Because, so we're still friends to this day, okay? There, there didn't need to be an apology because we fixed the relationship, okay? Does that make sense? If one person in the room knows these skills, it doesn't matter who else does. Okay? Even if you're 14 years old and she's 35. Okay? The relationship was fixed. Okay? So maybe the crucial conversation that you're thinking of right now that's not going well or that you're avoiding could benefit from some CPR. Right? Is it stuck because there's a content issue? Is it stuck because there are patterns? Okay? Or is just the relationship in trouble? So, uh, when my son comes home and curfew is 11 and he gets home at 11.15, that's a content issue, agreed? Mm -hmm. He does it three weekends in a row. Pattern. pattern, what's the pattern? Disrespect, right? Lack of understanding, okay? There's a pattern, right? That makes sense? What is it doing to my relationship with my son? I'm not gonna say yes to next weekend. Right? You're gonna get more chores. How's he gonna feel about that? He's gonna push back. That makes sense? So sometimes it's a content issue all by itself. The first time it happens, hey buddy, curfew's 11, you got home at 11.15, this is why curfew is 11. Mutual purpose, mutual respect, stay in dialogue, okay? So I'm working on the relationship. Happens a couple times in a row, hey, you're still late for curfew. I'm starting to feel like you don't respect my rules. I'm starting to feel like you don't respect my time, okay? Because I'm old now, I want to go to sleep, right? When your 25-year-old brother was your age, I was young, and I was still awake, and I was happy to pick him up, right? So, do you see the difference? Content is a specific thing. Could also become a pattern, but this is how you separate them in a the dialogue, okay? 
Another great skill that I love. So again, we haven't even started talking yet. We're still formulating what it is we're gonna say. So master my stories. So if my if this woman would have understood master my stories, she still could have had all the exact same concerns with a different tone, right? With different emphasis, uh, with lack of labels, okay? And we could have come to the same conclusion if she would have understood this, master my story, okay? So everything right here on the screen happens about that fast. We hear or see something, we tell ourselves a story, the story we tell makes us feel, and the way we feel determines our actions, right? You're driving down I-15, somebody cuts you off, you feel, right? Um, and then you drive up next to them and give them the angry fist, right? But if you knew that person was on their way to the hospital because they're about to become a nine-month-old grandpa, you'd be like, everybody get out of the way, this guy's gotta get to the hospital, right? You would feel so different. So when you see or hear something, instead of telling yourself a story, ask a question. Right? Why would a reasonable, and rational, decent person cut me off in traffic? Like, why would they do that? Like, they still might be a jerk, but we're engaging our brain by getting the blood flow there. Okay? So when you see or hear something, separate the facts from the story. Okay? He yelled at me. Well, my dad was a drill sergeant, and that doesn't sound like yelling. Okay? My mom was a nun, and I was way more than yelled at <laughs> So is it a fact that they yelled at you, or is it a story? Okay, is it a fact that they cut you off in traffic? Right, maybe you like a six-car buffer, maybe that person likes a two-car buffer, like, I don't know, is it a fact? So separate the facts from the stories. We can tell ourselves a more true story, which makes us feel more appropriate, more accurate in our action. Okay? So, master my stories. So we can help other people master their stories by asking them questions. And we can help ourselves master our own stories by asking ourselves questions. And sometimes the action that it leads to is, hey, can we have a conversation? Because at dinner the other night, you said something that was offensive, but I know you, we're, we're buddies. Like, we're buddies, and I don't think you would intentionally offend me, but I was offended. Could we talk about that? Absolutely. What did I say? You said this. Oh, I did say that. What I meant was, in the context we were talking about, I knew you didn't try to offend me. I knew that. Thanks so much for having this conversation. Okay? See or hear something, ask a question, so you can tell a more accurate story, so you can feel and act appropriately. Formulate. Everybody got this? We're almost ready to talk. Okay? Um, Alright, so let's talk about this. The best predictor of your ability to get to dialogue is the amount of curiosity you bring to the conversation. Uh, so I hope this comes across appropriately. I'm just intending to use this as just an anecdotal evidence for this, but um, one of the foremost marriage uh, therapists in the United States, uh, his name is, I can never remember his last name, and I'm forgetting right now, his first name is John. He can pre Yes, there you go, thank you. He can predict in five minutes, 95% accuracy, whether or not you'll still be married in five years. Okay? Puts two people in a room, talks to them, figures out what they fight about, and then says, okay, I'm gonna record you having this conversation for five minutes. Okay? And then he watches whether or not they get personal or whether or not they talk about the facts. Okay? So the best predictor of your ability to get to dialogue is the amount of curiosity that you bring to the conversation. Okay? Instead of attacking, labeling, making it personal, downgrading someone, demeaning them, demoralizing them, coercing them, all those things. Right? So here's an option. So this is an acronym called STATE. So we're gonna address your question now. That's a great question. So, um, so with my 15 year old, uh, there's two different parts to these, this STATE skill, okay? So I'm gonna share my facts. You're late for curfew, it's two nights in a row. Fact, right? 
and I'm going to tell my story. Feel like you don't care about my rules. Feel like you don't listen when I remind you before you leave that your curfew's at 11, whatever, whatever my story is, okay? And then I'm going to ask him to share how he got there, his path. Okay, what are the facts that you remember? Right? How do you actually feel about me? Do you, do you totally disrespect my rules or what is it, okay? How I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna talk tentatively and I'm gonna encourage him to talk. So to your point, I can say the exact same words. I could say, you're late for curfew two times in a row, makes me feel disrespected, makes me feel like you're not listening to me. What do you think? Okay, now watch this. Hey, buddy, you're late two nights in a row to curfew. It, it makes me feel disrespected. It makes me feel like you're not listening, but can you tell me what's up? Literally the same words, correct? Okay, so talk tentatively and encourage testing. So what I'm testing is my story, right? What if my son says, Dad, I didn't hear you. Because when the older kids were going out, their curfew was 11.30. So for 10 years of my life, all I've ever heard is 11.30. And so when you tell me 11, that's all I hear is 11.30. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay. So does he disrespect me? Does he not listen? Maybe. But do you see the difference? Okay, I never would have got that out if I just, hey, what's the deal? Idiot kid. Okay. So talk tentatively. Encourage them to share their facts and to share their stories because it does it does matter um, you can talk to almost anyone about almost anything if they know you care right if they feel safe so if my son feels safe then he's gonna tell me okay if he doesn't feel safe what's it gonna look like silence or Violence. Okay? Buddy, how come you're always late for curfew? <laughs> he just doesn't feel safe. Right? Buddy, how come you're always late for curfew? Why are you always hacking me about that? Why are you always on my case about that? It's the exact same thing. It's the exact same thing. He doesn't feel safe. He doesn't feel safe. Okay? So, every once in a while, um, you get a 15-year-old boy like mine, and when you ask him a question, he says, good. Okay? So I pick him up from school. How was school? Good. What was good about it? I don't know. Well, if you were to know, what was good about it? Stuff? <laughs> what kind of stuff? Things? Any things in particular? No. Well, why'd you say things? Disgust. <laughs> okay? You've been there too, right? So it's not just my son. Uh, you, you were there once too, just like me. So here's another skill called AMP. Um, so we ask, we mirror, we paraphrase, and we prime. Okay? So everybody knows old school well pump. Uh, walking through the desert, you come to this well in the middle of nowhere, and there's a gallon of water, and you're dying of thirst, and there's a note on the bucket that says, don't drink this, dump it down the well. Right? So if you drink it, you're satisfied, but then you're out of water. Okay? If you dump it down the well, then it primes the vacuum, and then you can pump that thing, and water will come out forever, and you'll be so hydrated that you want to fill up the bucket for the next person and put the note in a better spot so that they can read it easier than you could. Okay? So sometimes you'll get that, you no, know, <coughs> stuff, things, I don't know, because. Just give me something, right? Um, so it's still a lack of safety. So ask a question. Hey, can I can I ask you about your day? Right? Hey, can I ask you about that date last weekend? No, you can't ask me. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, you can ask me. And then you go from there. Okay. So you mirror. So I've been in sales for 27 years. Um, there's this great sales technique called mirror and match. Um, if, so I sit across the desk from somebody trying to sell them something, and 
they're doing one of those in their chair, and so I would lean back and do one of those in my chair, and then after like a minute or two, I would put my hand on the table, and about a minute or two later, he put his hand on the table. And so we'd sit in that pose for a second, then a couple minutes later, I'd put both hands on the table, and scoot my chair in, and then he'd put his, both hands, his, his hands on the table. So you can mirror and match, right? Um, so in a conversation, we can do the same thing. Now, one thing that I want to point out about this is that this is not a manipulation pattern. This is not, you know, crafty ways to get inside somebody's mind and coerce them into doing whatever you want because you know CPR, or you know AMP and State and Crib, and you know Master My Stories. Like, this is not manipulation because they will see your heart. They, they will see and they will feel what you really want. Okay, what I really want with my son is I want him to tell me about the impromptu backpacking trip they did last night at the top of Lake Mountain. Okay, he comes home and he's like, hey, me and the guys want to hike up to the top and spend the night. I'm like, sure, great, go ahead. And uh, so I watch him on his phone and text him every once in a while. Anyways, they go up to the top and they camp and they didn't take any food. I have no idea how they did this and came back in the morning at 9 o'clock and had a sprained ankle, and I got all kinds of questions, right? Are you hungry? Was it warm? Was it cold? Like, how'd you hurt your ankle? So, how did it go? Good? <laughs> well, what'd you do? Stuff. So, well, where'd you sleep? Somebody brought that. What'd you eat? Spoon. <laughs> okay? So, ask, hey, can I talk to you? Can I talk to you about your backpacking trip? Like, is now a good time? Like, I just am super curious how it went. Can I talk to you about it? Yeah, sure. So you can ask, okay, can we talk about it? Um, I can mirror, right? Whatever he tells me. How'd you do in the test? Fine. What's fine? I was happy. What were you happy with? Felt good. What did you feel good about? Right? So you can, you can, you can mirror whatever it is they're telling you to continue the conversation, okay? What are we watching for the whole time? <laughs> Silence or violence, we're watching for safety, okay? If at any time he says, why well, don't ask me about grades? Do I, I don't want this to be about grades, that's not what I'm asking. I, I wanna know how you did, see if I can help. I wanna know how you did, because if you did poorly because you didn't study, I would like to teach you better study habits because someday I want you to have a job, right? that you can support a family and yourself, and that will require that you research the client or you research the company's products so that you can, right? Like, that, that's what I, I don't really care about grades. Like I literally don't care. I care about all the work that's required to do good at school because those skills translate into real life, right? So I can mirror, you can mirror, okay? Um, paraphrase. So eventually he doesn't tell me anything, and I'm like, well, so you had fun, it was good, slept in a tent, sprained your ankle, anything else? I can paraphrase whatever I've got thus far to continue to prime the pump, continue to put in, to continue the conversation, okay? Can I ask you about the date? Yes. What did you think about this? Fine. What was fine about it? It was good. What was good about it? All of them. Okay, <laughs> continue to just paraphrase those things. Okay, um, prime when you're getting nowhere. So that's that's when we prime that pump when we're getting nowhere. Okay. Any questions about these two? Yeah. almost never stops talking, right? Um, so yeah, so again, silence or violence, how does she feel? Um, could be indicators of all of those different things. Does that make sense? Uh, it would be beneficial to ask her, hey, I noticed this. 
I paraphrase, I notice this. When you come home, I notice this. And when you're here, I notice this. Why is it different? Right? So master your stories. Right? See or hear something. Don't tell yourself a story. Ask for more facts. Right? Get the facts. So then proceed down that master your story path. Does that make the help? Okay. Yeah. This might be a big question. <coughs> Yeah, so just in case everybody didn't hear that, when you're having a conversation, a crucial conversation with somebody who traditionally shows disrespect continually over and over and over, how do you then talk to that person? So a contrasting statement is a great way to start that conversation. Right? I would really like to talk to you about this thing. Um, I don't want this to deteriorate into this. If it does deteriorate into that, I would like to pick up the conversation another time. So you're setting boundaries. Boundaries, yeah, boundaries. Okay, so that's a simple response to a, obviously a complex question that I don't know all the ins and outs of, but I get the gist of it. I've lived as well and I've had family and kids and friends and people tell my daughter that she's label label. Um, but a contrasting statement to set boundaries, okay? Um, part of a mirroring and matching is that it's talk tentatively, okay? So sometimes the way that you talk will encourage them to do the same. It's difficult when somebody blows up and continually attacks and you know, becomes disrespectful to stay in that place, right? Um, but, but recognize too, as hard as it is, that they don't feel safe. That, that's hard, right? Giving them just a little bit of grace, that's hard, especially after years and years and years and years and years. But set those boundaries, and then if you set a boundary, if, I, if it's important to me to have an 11 o'clock curfew and my son comes home at 11.15, I don't say anything, what happens? He comes home at 11.25 next time. And if I don't say anything, what happens? He comes home at midnight, okay? And pretty soon, he doesn't come home, right? So boundaries, okay? You have one at 11.01. That's really close. The curfew is 11. Okay, I need you to call. There are exceptions. I get that you're getting a ride home from his mom. And she sometimes is unreliable. Like, I get that. She's got little kids and bedtime runs late or whatever. And she can't get to you on time. I get that. If you're going to be 15 minutes late, I need you to call me at 1045. Okay, if you're going to be 15 minutes late, you call me at 1055. You're 10 minutes late. Boundaries. Okay, if it's important to me, to not be disrespected, then I'm going to set a boundary. And as soon as you disrespect me, I don't want this conversation to go this way. I'd like to talk about it another time. Goodbye. Yeah, hand over here. So if I understood, and just to repeat that, so sometimes when you bring up a contrasting statement, I don't want this, I do want that, they tend to dwell on the thing that you don't want, and they continue to stay on that subject. And you never get to what you do. So you never get to what you do want. Yeah. Um, I, so, so I would just again suggest, that I'm glad that you understand what it is that I don't want, right? So now I'm gonna ask, can we talk about the thing that I do want? Right? I'm glad that it's clear that when it comes to this particular thing, you understand what I don't want, because that's important to me. Equally important is this thing that I would like. Can we talk about that? Right? Yeah, good. Good. Any other questions? I just have one more. Yeah. Um, we decided with, with my, my sons that when we set a curfew, that uh, they would set the consequences of the curfew. They missed it. They had they knew it. Sure. Sure. Good. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, lots of lots of great things that we could that we could share for sure. Yeah.
Gotcha. Nope, that's fine. I appreciate that. This is my last slide right here. No, thank you. Yeah, so I wanted to have any questions at this point because state and AMP, these are the two places where now, after we've formulated all of that, this is where we talk, right? So we state our path, we AMP, okay? We do, this is how we get dialogue going the whole time, watching for signs of safety being violated, silence or violence showing up. We use all of our skills to restore safety. Um, we've had a good conversation. Hopefully we've got to the bottom of some of those things that have been addressed. And now how do we finish a conversation? Okay, this was a, this was a really, really good conversation. Um, you know, thank you for letting my daughter stay, for milk and cookies, and inviting her over in the morning, for hair and makeup, and driving her to school. That's great, see ya. Okay, like that, that's an option, certainly. Okay, or who will do what, by when, and how do we follow up? Okay, so um, one of the big things that happens in business all the time is Sometimes we have crappy meetings, but every once in a while you have a really, really good meeting. Right? There's lots of things that have been discussed, and you know, dust has been pushed out of the cobwebs and brought into the light. And things really feel like they're getting accomplished. And then, hey, thanks for coming to the meeting. This was really beneficial. The meeting's over. And you walk out feeling good, and the next day everything just goes right back. Okay? Because we never finished the conversation. Who will do what, by when, and how do we follow up? Okay? So going forward in our relationship, with this 14 year old girl, we recognize now that there will be times when basketball and dance don't work out, okay? So what we're going to do is master our stories, okay? What we're going to do is we're gonna to continue to follow up. If you continue to feel this way, we need to continue to have this conversation, okay? And I know that it's gonna happen because we already discussed how in basketball plans get made and we go and dance they don't get part of, become part of the plan. So we know this is gonna to continue to happen. So who will do what, by when, and how we're gonna follow up. Okay, so this is how you have to leave the conversation. Who will do what, by when. Okay, so it's time bound. Everybody knows their responsibility. Right? When we're in the airport, we see, if we see something, what do we do? We say something. Okay, it all fits together. Who will do what? Okay. You see something, you say something. Well, maybe in the airport we don't know who we say it to and then what they're going to do about it. But we just have to know our part. You see something, we say something, I did my part. Okay, they have to what? Nah. Okay. So who will do what by when? How do we follow up? And now we've bundled our conversation from the start. We've watched for safety to be violated. Safety's present, it's gone, it's lost, it's restored. We know how to do that through contrasting statements, through a good apology. Okay, we can restore safety. We recognize mutual purpose and mutual respect. We can be that peacemaker if that's what we're trying to do. We can have that conversation um, by creating boundaries, or excuse me, goals, by creating goals and strategies to make the relationship go forward. We can watch for all those things. Master our stories, CPR, state, and who will do what by when and how do we follow up, okay? Any questions? We have four minutes. And also, I'm gonna go get a snack too because I wanna rest my voice, yeah. So with your business, what is your business exactly? So I worked for Vital Smarts, Crucial Conversations for 13 years, training and consulting, Fortune 500 companies, healthcare, education, business, anybody who wanted better results, and just needed more dialogue, right? Um, COVID came in 2020, we did in-house classroom training just like this, half the company got fired. And so I got let go in April of 2020 and became a loan officer. So I do mortgages and have crucial conversations with realtors and buyers <laughs> every single day. High stakes, strong emotions, opposing opinions. Um, and this is, this is fantastic. The thing I love about this is so again, I sold this to so AEP, second largest energy company in the country. And we trained certified people and they would train these classes and I would check in on my contacts. And, hey, how's your first class go? It's been a month, it's been a year, how's it going? And every time I called, they would say, somebody came into my office yesterday, told me that they had a conversation with their spouse that they had not discussed in five years. Or somebody came in my office 
after the class and said that they talked to their teenager and neither one of them slammed the door or raised their voice. And then they would say, oh yeah, and by the way, it works good in the office too, okay? So I loved it because where it mattered most to me in the home is where I use these skills every single day. But I use them all the time in business, all the time. So do you do consulting? I do not. No, no. I have, but not officially. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So in the book, there's a, there's a 33 question true false test called Your Style Under Stress. So everybody that worked for the company, you know, got to go through the training and all those kind of things, and we got to go through it often so we could intelligently sell it to companies and help them talk about this. But you take this 33 question true false test, you read a question, and you're like, oh yeah, that's true, I do that all the time. Oh, true, true, oh, that's false, true, true. Anyway, so I take this test, it's like my first week at the job, and I show my wife the results of this test, I aced it, like, perfectly. And she's like, give me that. <laughs> she looks at the first one and she's like, oh, that's not true, that's false. <laughs> she looks at the second one she's like, oh, you said false, that's true. <laughs> and what I realized was, I read the first question and I was like, oh yeah, at work, I never do that. That's true. I read the second question, oh, at home, I always do that. Okay? So what I, what I did was I went back and I took the test four times. I took it once as a husband, then I took it once as a father, then I took it as an employee, and then I took it as a citizen in my community and my ward, okay? And I was my best self at work and my worst self at home. And it just changed me, right? Because my wife loves me and my kids love me and they're never gonna leave me. I was wrong. I was totally wrong. So this has helped me in every aspect of my life. At church, I was silent. I just sat there. And I was just silent. At work, I was really good. I mastered my stories, and I was I was really good at this before I ever went to there at work. But I was terrible at home. I was controlling, attacking, labeling. Right at church, I was silent, withdraw, hold. I was in the state presidency and Bishop Ricks, and I was, it just changed me. It just changed me. What book do you have? What book is it? So this book is called Crucial Conversations. So again, this is not my content. I just worked there for 13 years, and I loved it. I still love it. Uh, Crucial Conversations. You can find it on Audible. Um, I was going to say you can buy it at Barnes & Noble, but they're not there anymore. Yeah, if you would like it, yeah, come and see me and send me your, your email address. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you bet. 30 seconds left. Any other questions? Yeah. How does the validation, how would a conversation look like? Like, what would that look like? Yeah, sure. So, so the question was, how does this work like with the, when the balance of power is not equal, right? So father, son, or somebody has skills and somebody else doesn't. So this is not manipulation. You, you can do this and try to manipulate someone, but you've always experienced that already in your life and you can feel it. And it, it doesn't work, right? Somebody raises their hand and says, what do you do? Pattern of disrespect. We didn't, we've never spoken before. She recognizes that throughout her life. So this is not intended to be manipulation. So if somebody has good intentions, the right motive, their heart is in the right place, then this will work. So what do I really want for my son and my relationship? Do I really want him to come home at 11 o'clock? No, I really don't. Like, I really don't care. If he's with the right people at the right places, like, I really don't care. All those things will naturally come to the right conclusion and they will end. Right? What I want is, is him to learn discipline, because that will be needed for his entire life. Right? What I want is for him to learn boundaries. What I want is for him to understand the sleep schedule. What I want is for him to understand nutrition. What I want is for him to not take himself to exhaustion so his brain doesn't function well anymore. Like, those are things that I really want. Right? Because I have a 19-year-old, two 22-year-olds, and a 25-year-old, and I don't tell them what time to do anything. Because they learn all of those things from all of these things. Does that, does that help? Yeah, good question. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate your attention and your questions. And if there's anything else I can do while I'm here, happy to. Go, go enjoy some refreshing breaks.